This session is called The Next Wave of Disruptive Innovations. A lot of what we've been talking about here um, has effectively turned on the question of innovation. The way we do things currently in resource use uh, and environmental management is not efficient enough. Um, we need to improve the rates of efficiency um, within the economy and the use of, uh, of natural resources and the natural environment, and innovation is patently uh, a key part of that. So what we want to talk about uh, in this session is what is the next wave of innovations uh, which we can expect, how do we promote them, and, uh, and uh, how can the financial community in particular uh, recognise uh, them and reward them. Um, to introduce the subject, I'm delighted to uh, have with us James Bradfield Moody, who is the author of a, of a fascinating new book called The Sixth Wave. Um, he is taking time off from his job running the development uh, department of CSIRO, which is the major public uh, scientific uh, research organization in Australia. Also on the panel here, we have Thomas Stern, environmental economist from the University of Gothenburg, also working with the Environmental Defense Fund in the US. Gerrit Haynes, who is a partner at Osmosis uh, Investment, and Paul Druckmann from Accounting for, Sustain uh, for Sustainability. Um, I'm going to ask James to uh, uh, introduce the subject, uh, then get some comments from the panel. And again, if you're using your iPods and you can email me some questions, I'll be delighted to take some from the audience, both electronically and in person. James Bradfield Moody. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a real honor and a pleasure to talk to you today about uh, something that I'm particularly passionate about, the, the topic of, of disruptive innovation, and particularly how it applies to the resources space. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is talk to you first a bit about innovation itself. Because innovation, as some of you might, might know, is, is one of those what I call aerosol word, words. It's sort of like if you spray it around enough, everything starts to smell good uh, without necessarily knowing exactly what we're talking about. So if you ask what is innovation to a general person on the street, the first thing they might do is give you an answer. It's something a bit like this. One of my favorite little inventions, the toothbrush mobile phone. <laughs> now I love this thing, don't get me wrong, I, I love it mainly because I can't imagine the, the, the creative process that went through somebody's head to try to work it out. Is it, I'm brushing my teeth and I really need to make a phone call? Or is it, I'm on the phone yet my teeth are dirty? I'll make the way. Anyway, the interesting thing is this is not innovation, right? Innovation is not some new thing that's going to solve the world's problems like a toothbrush mobile phone. In fact, innovation is not a thing at all. Innovation is a process. It's actually the process of technological change. It's the process of somebody coming up with, say, the toothbrush mobile phone and then convincing somebody to then buy it, put it in their mouth and use it. And when you really start to pull out the fact that innovation is a process, it actually you realize it's not just about technology. It's about all the processes involved in going from idea to implementation. From, and it involves financial, involves technolo technological, uh, te te technical, involves regulatory processes, involves legal processes, and so on. And when you really dig into innovation, you realize that there's only three ways in which we see technological change occur. The first is we see a change in technology. Somebody creates something like a mobile phone and, and suddenly I can make phone calls in places where I otherwise couldn't. Isn't that great? But interesting, the second one, and, and one we're quite familiar as well, with as well, is, is a change in market. Somebody decides they want something to be colored pink. Well, they decide I'd rather send an SMS than make a phone call. I'd rather asynchronous communication than synchronous communication. But really, and this is where innovation theory gets very interesting, while we have changes in technology and changes in market influencing the world, by far most change actually comes from the stuff in the middle, which I'm going to call institutions. It's the way in which technology, and institutions can be, can be firm structures, they can be laws, they can be regulations, uh, they can be uh, cultures. And it's actually the ways in which technology make it to market and the ways in which markets send signals about which technologies are successful or not which are usually the things that determine whether the innovation occurs. Um, an introduction in Australia 10 years ago of a, of a consumption tax, a goods and services tax, actually had much bigger impact around development of new technologies as well as development of new markets than people generally realise. It's those institutional changes that can actually make a big impact. And in fact, when you really dig into innovation, and, and we'll get into the disruption piece in a second, it's generally the interplay between those three areas and we've already heard debates around is it technology or is it regulation or whatever. It's generally the interplay between them that makes all the difference and understanding how those things impact each other. 
And now and again what happens is you actually see massive interplay or massive changes in all three areas simultaneously and we're going to start getting into the resource area. And when that happens on a 30 year time scale, and it was Kondratiev, an econo a, a Russian economist who first started to look at this, followed by uh, Schumpeter and then Chris Freeman, you realize that since the Industrial Revolution we've actually had some massive changes and what they called long waves or waves of innovation. This is where we're getting massive changes in technologies, markets and institutions at the same time over around about a 30 to 40 year time frame which will reinforce each other. Um, you can see them here, it started with water and steam power, uh, moved on to railways, electrification, mass production and information and communications technology. And the interesting thing is at the beginning of one of those waves you get a lot of disruption. You get a lot of new businesses being formed, you get a lot of new technologies being created. Towards the middle of one of those waves you get what they call dominant designs emerging. Um, whether it's AC power or Microsoft Windows. And at the end, you get a global depression. And curiously enough, and, and you can see some of the things, this is a little bit of work that was done by Allianz, which I find really fascinating. Uh, this is the S&P 500 index for the last 200 years, um, rolling the long term, uh, the, uh, the rolling 10 year yield on that index. And you can actually see here, um, you, you might say those, 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 uh, those periods of, of downturn. I find, we won't go through them, but um, I find it very interesting uh, that Jeremy Grantham's slide around commodity prices is almost the inverse of this. You could see the prices speak, uh, peak at the same time as we had these troughs here. But I guess the interesting thing is I find those last two, uh, those waves you might say, particularly compelling. And it begs two questions. One is are we actually witnessing at the moment the transition from one wave of innovation to another, from the fifth wave of innovation to the sixth. Because if that is the case, then what we know about waves of innovation is that a lot of the things that we held true, a lot of the assumptions that are currently true, do no longer hold. We also know that those companies, those countries, those individuals that invest early, that actually start to pick out some of the rules of thumb over, the, say, the next five or ten years, are the ones that really succeed in those ways of innovation because we definitely know that the mix of companies from you know, even 100 years ago is completely different to the mix of companies now. Very, very rare do companies actually survive multiple ways of innovation. But the other thing is, and I, and I guess it begs the question, what might the next wave of innovation actually be? And I guess the research that we were doing, we were trying to identify, and the way you look for it is you look for massive changes in those three areas I mentioned before, massive changes in markets, technology and institution in the space that we came up with, and I guess it's no surprise that I'm therefore talking at this conference, is around the notion of resource efficiency. Because it seems to be that that is the place where we are seeing that massive change in all three areas. On the market side, it's that perfect storm that we've already heard about around um, increasing scarcity on one side, rising demand you know, for things like water or whatever it might be, coupled with a huge amount of waste in the system. At the institutional level, we're seeing um, the intern uh, internalization of externalities. We're starting to see things priced that were never priced before, but also changing business models. And at the technology side, we're starting to see a whole lot of interesting technologies emerging built around everything from green chemistry to clean tech and, uh, and so on. So just to conclude, and, and the, the interesting thing about these waves of innovation as well is that if you, if you, if you really start digging into this and understand those interplays, and, and I guess this is I guess, something for our panel to think about, you can actually start to draw out rules of thumb, rules of opportunity you might say. The rule of opportunity, the rule of thumb for the last wave of innovation, the fifth wave of innovation was not just about microprocessors, it was actually about transaction costs. This was Nicholas Negroponte who identified this. The rule of thumb for the last 30 years was find the largest transaction cost you can and apply information technology to it in a networked environment. Right? And that's what eBay and Microsoft and all these other ones did. Well, there are potentially some rules of thumb that are starting to emerge that we found when we looked at a whole real series of companies. Rules of thumb for things like waste equals opportunity. Identify the largest source of waste you can and either eliminate it to become more efficient or turn it into something else. There's brewing companies that are now finding ways that, of turning their grain waste into shiitake mushrooms. Or, or everybody here is sitting on a, on, a, on a chair. It means you're probably not driving your car. So what's happening with that capital asset? Car share services are starting to identify a way of getting rid of that waste. A second rule of thumb is starting to become, is emerging, seems to be around selling services, not products. Selling access rather than ownership. And how we can, because the interesting thing is if I was to sell um, somebody on this panel a washing machine, my incent their incentive might be for that washing machine to last for a very long time. My incentive might be for that washing machine to stop working after a while. 
maybe the warranty period plus a few days. Right? But if instead I sell them the service of a washing machine, then suddenly it's in both of our interests for that thing to last for a long time. Those two rules of thumb lead to a third one. If you want to find the waste in a system, or if you want to sell services, you know, light, light heat or heat or mobility, you need to actually start to monitor things, that we've, things the way we've never monitored before. And, and the convergence of what you might call the digital world and the natural world will become more and more, more, and more uh, uh, firm and, and uh, I guess deeper and deeper. Everything from that glass on that table to the light switch to, to this room to me will start to have a digital counterpart. The glass will have a radio frequency ID tag that says, I'm a glass, I'm a glass. The switch will be connected to the, to the smart grid. The room will be part of the building management system. And I already have my digital version. It's my mobile phone. It knows where I am. It's got a lot of information about me. Soon it will be, be my keys, my wallet, measure my heartbeat so I'll know whether I'm alive or not. It'll be fantastic. But this convergence of what's digital and what's natural, and these are 30 year time frames, becomes really important. So Michael, hopefully I've given you and the panel a few things to think about. I'm happy to talk about some more, but the, 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 I guess the central question is, if indeed we are witnessing one of these periods, one of these transition points, then perhaps uh, I guess the, the shift from an old mode of, mode of operation to a new mode, one where we've been previously harvesting resources that were plentiful and cheap, to one where we might be managing resources that are scarce and valuable, that shift could be as profound as, as, as some of the other shifts that we've seen, whether it's the Industrial Revolution, the Information Communication Technology Revolution, and others. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Let me just start by asking you what your evidence is for this, because this, this, this is a wonderful story if it's true, because it would make us all relax. And the great thing about these previous waves is that um, at least we can question this, but um, they have occurred without, um, a, 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 as if they've looked as if they've occurred, and this is something that we can come back to, um, without great purposeful intervention from the centre to make them happen. They've happened because technologies have been developed in diverse ways, in companies, in dispersed ways. Um, so, one, uh, so one question is, is, um, is this just going to happen then? So in fact, do, should we just sit back and say, well look, this is going to happen, there's going to be a sixth wave and the world's problems are going to be solved. And the second one is how much real evidence is there for this being a new wave? We've, it took a long time for us to realise that these other technologies would become this central driving force of a, new, of a new wave. How much evidence really is there, or is this just a good story, that it would be nice if it were true? So, look, I, I like the Vice-Chancellor's comment at the beginning. I mean, predicting the future is a dangerous game, right? It's a very dangerous game, and you always have to take it with a, a grain of salt. We, I, I run the Futures Unit for the CSIRO, which is really where a lot of this thinking came from. And our job as the National Research Agency was to try to predict, or try to invest um, the $1.2 billion that we invest every year into areas where there will be opportunity or, or change for, for the nation, for Australia. Um, we actually looked at, um, we, we did a project which we called the Megatrends Project, where we tried to identify uh, all the, it's, it's very hard to predict individual trends, but when you start to coalesce those trends, when you actually start to, to find out where those trends intersect, you start to increase the confidence that you have around those particular trends. And when we, when we looked at all those different trends um, that I, that um, those shape, and there is trends around health and there's trends around security and everything like that, a lot of them kept on pointing back towards this notion. In fact, over 50, uh, 50 percent, it was, a, I think it was 56 percent or something, really were all about this whole central message around resource efficiency. And when you took that away, there wasn't a cohesive story around everything else. So, so I guess once again, the futures, the foresight game is, is a very difficult one. Um, but I'd also look, there's, there's some very interesting parallels. Uh, it, it's, what, what is that saying? If you, if you don't um, understand the future, you're doomed to repeat it. Some very interesting parallels between what's happening now and previous waves. You know, everything from, uh, for example, the Industrial Revolution. What's the story there? One of the, well, there's many stories, but one of them was when we decoupled economic growth from labour. If you wanted more chairs, you needed more people to make chairs. Right? And so we started talking about labour productivity and, and all those particular things. Well, that's fine, and we separated and decoupled those two things. But then for the 200 years, economic growth and resource consumption are generally coupled. Well, maybe that same story is just playing out with a different part of the total factor productivity equation that Amory Lovins was talking about today, uh, that he mentioned. Just a different part of that equation is starting to play out uh, in, a, in a different way. 
Okay, I want to come back to the question later then of, of whether anything needs to be done, as it oh, were, exactly. to, to promote this. Let's come back to this. I want to bring in uh, the panel. Um, uh, uh, Garrett Haynes, you run an investment uh, company. Um, and uh, this, in a sense, brings us back to the question we were discussing before the break about um, uh, weather resource efficiency, which is the driving force that um, uh, James says will be the, in, in the uh, sixth wave, whether that creates shareholder value. Is your experience that it does? Uh, yes, it does. In fact, I was downstairs in the, uh, in the waiting in the room listening to the previous session uh, when, uh, when I heard uh, through the whole of the discussion that there was a need for metrics to, to measure resource efficiency, and that's what we do. Um, and there I was jumping up and down a floor beneath us rather than being up here. And I'd like to just kind of uh, talk about that a little bit. And, and, and point to the fact that, that resource efficiency is, is, is a driver of, of shareholder value, and it's not necessarily through disruptive innovation, but through innovation and continuous innovation, as, as, as James is, is talking about. Um, we build, um, we've, we've created metrics to, to uh, measure resource efficiency in public companies, and we do that uh, in a very objective way. We, we measure the amount of of energy that a company consumes, we measure the amount of waste that they create, the amount of water that they, they use in their processes, and uh, we, uh, we take that relative to the amount of, or to the unit, uh, unit of value that they create. So we measure resource to revenue generated, and that tells us quite a lot about a, a company. Uh, we're able to then uh, objectively rank those companies or rate companies across the whole of the, the global economy by their resource intensity, which is uh, uh, very telling. It's uh, an indicator of a number of things. It, it uh, ultimately, I think, is an indicator, as we heard earlier today, the, the previous session, but earlier today, that it's an indicator of good, um, a well-managed company, a company that shows characteristics of good corporate governance. Um, we have uh, an ability to to understand the, the intensity, the resource intensity of businesses, but we don't necessarily understand why because of the way that we create these, the, the, uh, the metrics. But then we can circle around and, and understand these companies and study these companies and understand them more deeply. And we find that it is innovation at the various companies that, uh, that, are, that, that is at the core of the, the shareholder value, value that's being created. Uh, uh, we were talking earlier about uh, one of the larger companies in our basket, a company called Boeing uh, Aerospace that everybody knows. Uh, Boeing, uh, 15 years ago, started to implement technologies internally to uh, using the, the uh, technologies that they have been or had been selling to public utilities for a long time to uh, better distribute electricity through or the power through their production facilities. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's not big disruption, but it's certainly innovation, internal innovation, that disrupts their business and, uh, and reduces their energy costs over a long period of time and continues to do that. And from a competitive perspective, uh, they, they simply get better and better. Uh, and that, that happens in uh, industries across the economy. So yes, it is one leads to the other, and it's the result of, of innovative innovation generally. And your metric will show up. I mean, once you've understood, as you say, what's going on in the company, will show up those innovations that are talking about in the value that's created, and that's what that. Not necessarily directly. We have to go and find it. Uh, what we do is measure all of the water that's consumed, and we we. Um, we measure that against the amount of, of value that that company creates. We have a water intensity. We can go back in time and find where that, that intensity is diverged from uh, some of the competitors that they have and, and then start to understand that company, and, uh, engage with that company and find out what it is that, uh, that, that they're doing. We find that that's the case with a, a large number of companies, the companies that, that are positively uh, the resource, uh, resource efficient have over the course of the last five, seven, 12, 15 years uh, changed the processes. They're not necessarily the, um, uh, they, they haven't reinvented a mobile phone or, or a new automobile. They simply change the way that they do things. Uh, and therein lies the innovation that, that uh, allows them to show greater return on assets, greater return on equity, and greater operating margins, et cetera. Thank you. Thomas Turner, from, uh, you're an economist. Um, uh, 
for your sins, uh, as it were. Um, I was going to say, but you're feeling better now. Um, the, the interesting thing I thought about, or one of the interesting things James said was that uh, innovation is not just technology. Uh, which is the sort of paradigm case, the idea we have of it, but occurs in institutions uh, as well and in markets and so on. And you've, been, uh, you, you've written very interestingly about innovation in public policy, in the kinds of ways in which public policy can intervene to generate resource efficiency. Could you tell us a little bit about, about your discoveries there? Yeah, I think we've had some, um, some telling examples today in the earlier panels. People have been complaining about policies that don't work. We heard quite a lot about um, the, the dangers of biofuel mandates, the dangers of subsidies to various, of various kinds. And we heard most depressingly of the uh, difficulty for politicians at the national and even more so at the international level of agreeing on the policy that would be best, which is the, um, the carbon price, carbon tax or, or permit scheme that creates a price. Um, so uh, there is a need for policy innovation and I think there are some interesting examples and of course the, the sort of the mother of all, um, um, of all policy instruments is property rights. And I, so I think we have some interesting examples from uh, the area of fishing for example where we have rights based management uh, sometimes referred to as cat shares or ITQs. And uh, we have found there that this is a way of untying, um, deconstructing somehow the conflict that has been. The last 30 or 40 years, we've been locked into a very unproductive conflict. On the one hand, most people, economists, policymakers, realize that you need fishing policy. It's, a, it's an open access, uh, you know, there's a, there's a gigantic market failure. Even the most uh, free market economists agree that we need a policy. And in fact, most fishing countries have policies, but they usually have the wrong policies that make things worse. They, they sort of subsidize fishing. And this is, of course, largely due to the lobbying power of the, of, of the fisheries who are small and concentrated and, and dominate the, the, the discussion. Now, with the introduction of, of rights-based management, uh, what has happened is that the, the sort of the, the, the nature of this game between the fisheries uh, and the policymaker has changed. And the fishery um, operators, the, the fishermen, um, they cease to discard fish and they cease to fight the biologists who are saying that the, the stocks are too small. They employ the biologists instead um, because the stock is now theirs. And this, in a simple way, illustrates, um, it's not like it's the only thing we have to do, but it's still, it's, it's, it's a, a very major part of the battle that, that has to be done. And by doing this, this one uh, change, it, you then get a, a different uh, dialogue between the stakeholders. And I think there's a very similar uh, lesson in, when it comes to property rights in, in, on land, uh, property rights to, to rainforest, property rights in, in developing countries, where in fact um, one of the reasons why, why um, for instance, biofuel um, programs go wrong is, is that there are unclear property rights to, to forests and, and to land in general in many developing countries. So the clarification of, of property rights is, is a sort of a, a very general and high level is an important innovation in when it comes to policy instruments. If I may, I could mention a few others. And I, I, think, you know, <laughs> I think that uh, environmental fiscal reform is, is an area that is promising um, and uh, it's conveniently can be triggered, in fact, by crises. This happened in, in the Scandinavian countries, in Sweden and Norway, for instance, in the early 1990s, in response to, to a, a crisis. Um, carbon taxes were introduced that are very much higher than the carbon taxes and the, and the permit prices in, in the rest of the world. And they have been quite effective. They have not had any negative effects, uh, and they have led to a, a, a large adoption of, um, of wood, usually, and energy efficiency over um, fossil fuels. Um, gasoline taxes in Europe and are another good example. Um, 
Very often, uh, when it comes to policy design, there's uh, two things that are important. One is the efficiency. You have to choose efficient instruments or instruments that promote efficiency. But you also have to think quite a lot about fairness. Uh, fairness is, uh, is paramount, and, and even myths about fairness are quite important. So one of the, the best arguments against gasoline taxes is that it's bad for the poor. This is a great argument. It sort of stops the conversation. But it's not true, globally speaking. Um, typically, um, the poor don't use very much. They don't have big budget shares on, on gasoline. And so it's, it acts almost like a, a luxury tax in, in developing countries. And uh, I've studied this in, in numerous countries in Africa, Indonesia, China, India, and so on. Um, a, a tax on gasoline is, in fact, strongly progressive. OK, thank you. That's, um, I want to come back to this question of the role of public policy in the resource uh, um, uh, the, the, the sixth wave or the resource uh, efficiency uh, wave. Before we do that, let's um, uh, bring in Paul Druckmann. Um, one doesn't normally think of, a, of accountancy as a profession uh, full of innovation, or at least where it is, it tends to be criminal. Um, <laughs> give, give, us, give, us, give us the positive story. Would you like to tell you a story about economists first? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> um, I, actually, coming from a software background that I did after qualifying as an accountant, um, I suppose if one's born an accountant, one remains an accountant. Um, but I have to say that uh, one of the things that uh, the new president of uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Development said, Peter Backer, he said that um, the accountants or the bean counters uh, will save the world, and um, I hope that we can have our own contribution. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about was measurement and reporting, which I know has, was a little bit around um, the previous uh, session as well, uh, because uh, this can lead to behavioural change, and does within corporates and within investors lead to behavioural change. And I was trying to, to, to decide about the disruptive part of this and the incremental part. Um, and uh, if you think of the work that's, been, that's happening at the moment and has happened over recent times, um, you know, I applaud the efforts of CDP and the like around what I would call data plus, adding data to the process to enable measurement um, and reporting. And also you know, the, 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 more, uh, the, the work that Puma and now PPR are doing around the drive towards uh, monetizing externalities I think is is a fantastic innovation. Um, I think the, the, the thing that we have to be very careful of, and I'm concerned out of what happened out of Rio, and I noticed that Andy Miller uh, in the last session of SAB Miller, uh, sorry, Andy Wales of SAB Miller, um, talked about um, Rio. And at Rio, there was a paragraph 47 that came out about sustainability reporting. And I think the real danger is that that sort of thing becomes a silo or a niche, um, that, and, and it isn't integrated or central into the, the business and the investor world. Um, and I think what we've got to be careful of is that certainly, I'm sure I, I won't speak on behalf of the CFO of Unilever, but other CFOs that I know and spoken to, you know, we've just got to be careful that we're not producing more and that it is disruptive what we are producing, that it isn't just incremental. Um, and I hope that what we're doing with integrated reporting with the uh, IRC um, will help to create this understanding of creation and preservation of value um, into the short, medium and long term. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that's where our main contribution can come, is actually bringing it all together to show that picture. Um. I'm going to exercise my chair's prerogative. I haven't got very many questions. I don't know whether that's because this isn't working or, or not. But um, uh, I wanted to ask James um, uh, 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 about this, uh, this new wave. You say there is evidence that, there, that this is beginning to occur. Um, we also know that almost all environmental indicators around the world are getting worse. Um, and uh, so the obvious question is, it's clearly not, this is a statement actually, isn't it? It's clearly not occurring fast enough. Do you, what's the rate of acceleration, as it were? Do we, can you see this, that you see apparently sort of spontaneously occurring within 
the economy, actually taking, uh, you know, getting to the levels at which actually environmental indicators start getting better because growth is being outweighed by efficiency or, or not? I, I think this is, Michael, li linked to your question of will this happen anyway? You know, how much of this is pre-programmed in? And, and the way I'd, I'd look at that is, imagine this is a conference 30 years ago, right? It's, it's 1980 and we're talking about the internet. And we'd say, in, you know, we, we need to try to find a way of connecting 80% of the world's population to a mobile phone, right? Which is the current status of today. And if you tried to cost it and you looked at it and you looked at all the institutional issues and all the pushback, and so that's impossible. It's going to be too hard. You know, this will never necessarily change it. Yet if you looked at Moore's Law, uh, which is doubling in, in price performance ratio every, every 18 months, if you looked at Metcalfe's Law, which is all about networking and the fear of not being part of the network, if you looked at the, the huge amount of transaction costs that came out of the fourth wave, which is really what paid for the whole lot, if you looked at all those things together, you'd realise that we're actually on this trajectory to make that stuff happen. And then the real question becomes, as you said, around rate, and what rate will that occur, and also around winners and losers. Because the, the, the thing we know about, and this is where the disruption really comes in, we know between waves of innovation, there, there's a lot of, there is actually a lot of change. It can be very incremental at the time, but suddenly you can get a, the world can look completely different. In fact, there's only two companies, really big ones, that, that are really good at surfing multiple waves of innovation, that's GE and IBM. And both of them, you'll notice, have re been reinventing themselves around services and eco-imagination and so on. And so the question then becomes really, you know, how do, and how, who will win, who will lose, which countries will win, which countries will accelerate, which ones won't. And that is an interesting question for the public policy debate because I think it reframes the sustainability debate to be more about are we going to take advantage of the opportunities? Where are the opportunities? How will we get ahead of the pack? Um, so, so for me, that's the, that's the way of looking at it. I think, um, you know, the other question is, you know, how much disruption occurs along the pathway? How many lives are affected? How many businesses? How many jobs? And, and so on. Um, how, much, how much dislocation? So, so I think, I hope that's answered your question. I, I do have here, for ex though, um, a list of questions if you want for the, for the panel, because this might be the last chance I get to share them. If I, was, if I was actually thinking about where is the disruption going to come from? Right? You know, I'd be asking questions, where is the waste in this system? Like you can ask, where is the waste in the room? What do we produce that we do not sell? What are the services that we really provide, either as a nation or as a company? Because often, I, I was talking with a country that, company that was, was selling um, roadside assistance. They weren't selling roadside assistance, they were selling reliability. Right? And once they reframed their business, that is a disruption to their entire business. They realised they could maybe go into public, public transport, whatever it might be. Um, you know, where are our contingent liabilities? That's all about understanding exactly what's, what's, what our resources, what our resource mix is um, that Garrett was talking about. Um, what is the digital version of us? What is the digital version of what we do or we use or we sell? Because the interesting thing is, if, you, if a company or a country doesn't answer those questions, and there's probably a few more there, somebody else will, and they will disrupt you. And that's the piece that I think is really fascinating because somebody else will exploit that waste that you didn't exploit. Somebody, you know, there'll be some big institutional changes like the joining of the mobility and the transportation, sorry, the mobility and the energy grid we haven't really talked that much about today. That's a big disruption. Um, collaborative consumption, the peer-to-peer -peer networks, that's a big disruption. Um, it's very helpful to have a panel that asks its own questions as well as answering them. Um, uh, Thomas, you wanted to come back on yes. this. Well, I, I thought that was very provocative of you to say that all indicators are getting worse. And of course, very many environmental indicators have gotten very much better. Uh, when I went to school in, uh, in London, uh, the smog was so bad that I would uh, sort of hold my hand against the wall. I didn't have to, you know, just to not get lost because you couldn't really see more than... You look much younger than you obviously are then. <laughs> Thank you. I was hoping that. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, Hans Rosling's um, uh, presentation today earlier showed that also this, this is generally the fact in, in the third world. And um, the fact that uh, life expectancies have gone up so much is, of course, is um, a reflection of the fact that we now have clean water uh, and a number of other. Uh, we've solved the many problems. We've got rid of lead in gasoline. We've got rid of a few uh, CFCs and a few other things. I think, though, we can learn something by looking at which problems we manage to solve and which ones we don't. And in fact, there's even a connection between them because we solve problems, like when we wash ourselves, that's removing dirt from one place and putting it somewhere else, usually in the sea, ultimately. 
Um, now, we solve a lot of other problems by uh, using more electricity and thereby making, in many cases, um, the problems of, of um, climate change worse. And in fact, problems are more difficult to solve when the, external, the distance between the uh, producer and the recipient of the externality is large. And global externalities are the most difficult because they inevitably raise the a coordination question and a fairness question of, um, of, of how to deal with, with climate externalities uh, uh, at, at such a global scale. I think that it's, it's commonplace to sort of complain about the United Nations uh, process being uh, slow and ineffective. I think it's, it's, in all fairness, we have to appreciate how complicated this process is. The, the law of the seas negotiations in, uh, in the United Nations took some 30, 40 years to privatize a large part of the seas. This is a lot of wealth we're talking about. And uh, the atmosphere, or the carbon content of it, is, represents a lot of uh, rent. And it's ultimately a question, should India, for instance, should they get a fifth of this rent because they have a fifth of the world's population? Or should they get 5% because they currently emit 5% of carbon emissions? So it's really a matter of, of um, it, it's hard to, to conclude these negotiations without facing up to fairness issues. That, I think, is, is going to take time. Um. I've had a question uh, uh, here from, from the audience, um, which is about um, financial innovation, of which there was a great deal in the, in the last 20, 30 years. There's been a huge amount of innovation in the financial sector. And many people would argue that it's not been uh, a great contributor to wealth creation. I mean, it w created wealth for a while, and then a huge amount of wealth was destroyed um, uh, after the crash by this. How do you fit, James, financial innovation into your understanding of waves of innovation? I think, so, I mean, financial innovation has each wave, and, and, and it was interesting that Paul talked about it. I mean, the, if you look at what the, um, the accounting industry did for around about the third wave, when it finally standardised a lot of the things around profit and so on, and allowed investment into capital to be done transparently, that was a huge innovation that actually caused this to occur. With waves of innovation, what generally happens is the first, what they call the upswing, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, there are huge amounts of growth, and that's generally from actual value creation. Then, during the downswing, you're still getting growth, but actually you're, you're, you're not getting as much growth. And that's when we start to try to find instruments to maintain those levels of growth. And I think, I believe that one of the things that we did over the last 10 years is we started creating growth without value. And, 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 and that's, and I, and I actually believe that, that Bill Clinton said that um, once at, at Davos as well. Uh, I'm quoting you if Bill's in the audience. Um, because that seemed to be a lot of the policy mechanisms, whether it's around property prices, whether it's around finding the next decimal point, in terms of subprime or whatever it might be, seem to be about creating growth without value. And that is a cycle that often happens where we try to keep on scrambling for the same levels of growth that we've, been exceed, that we've currently been doing without necessarily finding new sources of value, which, which I guess is the, the, the question for the sixth wave. But your, your argument that in previous waves there has been a, a financial uh, element to it, which has is, which is added to the wave or whatever, can we identify perhaps our two um, uh, 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 people on the financial side on the panel? Can you identify what will be the next wave of innovation within the financial sector which will support the technological innovation? Do you, do you see, for example, Garrett, the work that you're doing more widely applicable and that other fund managers should be doing this, or is that just going to erode your competitive advantage as a, as a fund manager? Do you want to see this standardised, the kinds of models you're, uh, you're doing, to support innovation in the real economy? Oh, and I think uh, what Paul and I are doing separately are, are effectively dovetailing together. What, uh, what we're doing is taking uh, the information that uh, has been collected from public companies over the last decade or so, but has fallen on the floor because the analysts at the, the large investment banks don't feel that it's that it's um, in a uh, in a size or a shape that's that, that's sufficient for them to put it into their to, to their models. Uh, Paul and and a number of people on the uh, uh, on the reporting side, the, the GRI as well, are trying to standardize, standardize a lot of this, this information. We feel like we're disrupting the marketplace. We're using unused information to, uh, to ultimately find, um, uh, create portfolios or, or find some uh, investment return that others aren't, be, aren't able to find. Paul, do you want to come in? 
I, I would take it back to value and what does value mean. I think, you know, the, in, in, in the financial instruments that we've had in the, the recent wave, it's all been around pro short term profitability. And what we're looking at now is organized companies and investors recognizing that companies actually have um, a, a different methodology of creating value. And if you think about value in, in different terms, in innovative terms, then you've got to think about, you know, just, just, you know, that it isn't just the short term profit that's coming through in terms of cash flow, but it's actually the value of the business going forward. And will that business still have its value in the future and still be part of a society that we all want to belong to? Unfortunately, this session was too short because none of you got here in time. Um, uh, and because uh, the whole thing is overrun a little bit. And I've been asked not to overrun this session um, because we want to give you uh, a, um, a, a proper bake, a break, which unfortunately means that um, I'm going to draw it to a close. But I want to, ask, I want to ask the panel members one thing, so with due, due respect to the organisers, um, which is what, do, what is the role? We, we can clearly see what the role for businesses is in this, to find the innovations to uh, innovate and so on. There's a role. What's the role for public policy? Is there anything you've, you've indicated a bit about uh, what uh, economics is there anything that governments, public policy can do to actually to stimulate innovation, to create the conditions for innovation? Do we know anything about the conditions in which innovation arises? Just to see whether there's a, uh, any responses on that. James, do you want to, to start? Uh, there's a huge role for public policy. In fact, there's, every, there's, a, there's a role for everybody can, to, to, to collaborate with this business, public policy, and civil society as it's come out. Um, I go back to the, the, the old truism um, in innovation theory. Success is the biggest inhibitor of innovation. It's actually when you're most successful is often when you're least likely to change. And that's one of the reasons why we get these wave functions and so on, we can dig into that. One of the things for public policy to do, I think, is to actually recognise, and it's this notion of value, it's the notion of what's the, you know, what are rents and so on. It's actually about the operating conditions for business. And it's, the, it's about what is going to help facilitate change, what is going to stimulate, what is going to incentivise change, what is, when, when do they need to get out of the way, and so on. That's the interesting space for public policy in this entire debate. And it's really about how do we unleash the opportunity. Thomas. Thank you. Well, uh, quickly. Unfortunately, change will not come on its own. And there, there's, for instance, a market failure in research. Um, if you invest tons and tons of money into research and, and develop something that will cure cancer or cure us from global warming, then others can steal the invention. That is the fundamental reason why private capital will not supply enough research and why it should be subsidized. Any of you want to add? I, I mean, I would simply say that we've got to be careful that we don't add red tape to the whole process for, with public policy. Um, I mean, I think regulation can, can drive and assist, but we've just got to be careful that we don't put in a whole load of regulations that don't actually contribute. I, I think. James is right in that, uh, uh, that the public policy is setting, sets a framework, and that's fine. But we, I disagree with success being the, the inhibitor. I think we've become more efficient. I know we've become more energy efficient every year since the early 19th century. And we continue to become less resource intensive in everything that we do. So innovation is continuing all the time. I think that what we need to focus on is uh, is rather than try, waiting for public policy to, uh, to, to help us with any decisions, businesses just get on with it, and that's what they're doing. They've been doing that for a long time. It's economic, it makes economic sense to be more efficient, particularly more resource efficient. That's why companies do it. It's not, it's not down to uh, doing the right thing. Doing the right thing is a, is a byproduct. Becoming more economically, economic efficiency is, is about e economic uh, imperative. Great. Thank you very much indeed. I do apologise that we have to cut it short. Um, uh, this is a topic which we could certainly have spent uh, longer on. Um, can I thank you all uh, for uh, the questions that I did receive? Can I thank the panel uh, um, for your contributions? Thank you very much indeed. Um,